the slide presentation I did when I went to Pittsburgh. I actually went to Altoona, PA, and put this on for like about 26 uh, people. Uh, it was created years ago, and it's been updated uh, mostly by Matt Vanderhart and Chima. And uh, I believe it does meet the standards of the three organizations. And there are a lot of slides, so I'm just going to start chugging away. All right. That was the coaching clinic we did at the Winter Nationals uh, before the pandemic. That seems to be one of the biggest ones uh, in the country. And thank you for choosing to coach, properly teaching. Judo is critical for our judo to flourish and survive. Nearly all high-level competitors in judo got their starts at local grassroots judo programs. And the need for quality grassroots instructors is more important than ever. And that's an understatement. Thanks again for choosing to be a coach. Okay, so we're going to do level one and level two. We're going to go over principles of coaching, behavior, teaching, finding your focus, students and parents' interest, age-appropriate training. And nothing is of greater importance than education. The teachings of one virtuous man or woman can reach many. And that which has been learned by one generation can be passed to a hundred. Let's talk about Kano for a minute. Uh, you know, various people have various disciplines they approach life in. And I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that the discipline that Kano approached life from was that of an educator. And I do have lots of friends that are educators, particularly I think of my good friend Hayward Nishioka, who's an educator, and they have a, a paradigm for the way they, they look at the world. They like to put things into a syllabus. They like to put things into something that can be taught over a period of a semester. And then at the end of the semester, they like to have a test in order to see how much you absorbed of what they taught, not only from the standpoint of what you learned, but to see how effective they were as teachers. So that is the teacher paradigm that they look at the world. If you were a business person, an accountant, a salesperson, you have a different paradigm. So again, this is uh, really based on, on uh, the teaching paradigm according to Kano. So having a well-developed philosophy removes uncertainty about training rules, styles of play, discipline, codes of conduct, competitive outlook, short-term objectives, and of course, long-term objectives. Developing a philosophy of coaching, and you'll see a lot of pictures I've thrown in from historical things going back to my beginnings in judo, that, that group picture is probably from about 1970 at Mr. King's Club. How many can spot me in that picture? I, I can tell you, I am the fourth guy in the top row from the left with all that hair, believe it or not. And some of the other people in that picture include Kuha Kim, my my dad, my 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 surrogate dad. Uh, next to him is Frank Brzezinski, who was a fifth don. There are a lot of judo people in this picture. John Belushak, who has a school in Clareton, PA. He's down below. I have where I have the arrow. And that picture on the left is me getting the AAU uh, regional championship award when I was, I think, about 13. And some other famous judo instructors from Pittsburgh, like PCLO, the late PCLO, and uh, Bob Boge, who was an FBI guy, are in the picture. So the main objectives are the things that you value and want to achieve. Your beliefs and principles that help you achieve your objectives. Philosophy is acquired from an accumulation of multiple experiences. Developing a useful coach, coaching philosophy involves two major tasks. This is very important, self-awareness. 
I mean, the, the end principle of judo, chiko no kensai, perfection, perfection of the character. I've done a lot of thinking about what that means. I mean, you know, does that mean we want to turn into a god and be perfect? Obviously, Kano didn't have that in mind. The closest thing I could come to what he meant is in the West, the Maslow hierarchy of needs and the, the top achievement according to uh, Maslow was the uh, achievement of self-actualization. That's a person who's comfortable in their own skin. And I can tell you many examples of judo people I've seen over the years that have a persona that everyone knows except for them. It's amazing to me that Kano said self-awareness and self-actualization were the goals of a person seeking perfection of their character Yet I meet judo people, very high ranking judo people who have absolutely not a clue what their, what their persona is, how they come across. I'll give you an example. When I talk at Nanka tournaments, one of my nemesis friends, Glenn Koyama, says, get that mic away from Gary. I laugh about it because it's true. I can talk to nauseam. I understand that about myself. I accept that about myself. In fact, I seek to be around people who tell me more things about myself, some of the things I probably don't want to hear, but those are the kinds of people that I like to be surrounded by, particularly in judo and real particularly in business, because they're the types of people that tell you when you're taking a long walk off a short pier and they're telling you, you're not doing that good, boss. <laughs> Or the people you don't want around or the people who are saying, keep going, you're doing great. Deciding what your objectives are in coaching. Very, very important. Self-awareness. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. As a coach, you must know who you are before you can help your athletes know who they are. If you have a direction and a commitment, you can impart these to your athletes. What your athletes see when you behave with reasonable consistency, they will be more likely to respond appropriately with their consistency. They'll take you seriously if they see that you live up to the words and deeds that you preach. Uh, if you demonstrate character in guiding your athletes through the competitive experience, you will most likely build character in those you guide. And what you teach may well be less important than what you demonstrate through your character. In other words, are you, are you, are you uh, living the, the uh, projection of the persona that you're, that you're uh, giving people as an example to follow? You can increase your self-awareness two ways, by reflecting on your own beliefs and, and assumptions and by requesting feedback from other people on how they see you and how they may react to you. As much as it hurts, I relish the opportunity to get hardcore, un, un, uncensored feedback. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world, songwriter, singer, Neil Young, I remember when I was at the Oakland Coliseum in 1974, the first time I got to see Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young perform as a group, Neil Young was doing one of his new songs called Ambulance Blues. I believe he was in some sort of state where he was in an ambulance being escorted to the ER and he was kind of having delusions. And one of his lines in that song is, you're all just pissing in the wind. And there is nothing like a friend who can tell you when you're just pissing in the wind. That's a good friend. That's the kind of person over the years, as much as I hate them, I love being around those kinds of people because that's when growth is going to occur. Ask yourself, and these are some of the people that were at my clinic recently in uh, Altoona. You can see a lot of my Pittsburgh buddies, Jan Finkbeiner, Paul Bova, Dave Brogan and his wife, uh, Jeff, I don't think you made that one. Oh, wait, I think you're up in that corner. There I see you. Why do I coach? Am I coaching for the right reasons? What are my goals as a coach? 
Am I a good coach? What would make me a better coach? Why do you coach? Top 10 reasons from coach to youth sports. You love children. And it doesn't necessarily have to be children because I coach all ages. At my club right now, I have probably about 105 active students. I literally have students from three to past 70 years old. And believe me, the way I have to teach the three-year-olds is not the same way I teach the people my age. You wanna be a positive role model. You love the game and wanna pass that love on to your students. You've seen coaches who are not doing it right and you wanna do your part to correct that. You wanna show your students that hard work and fun can go hand in hand. You wanna make a difference in people's lives. Notice I'm changing this from child to every age. And I'm correcting this as I'm going along in my mind. You're tired of hearing about abusive coaches and wanna be part of the changing tide. You love competition and winning, but not more than you love to see your players and people develop. You wanna give back to, this, to judo that impacted you. And you wanna be part of the, the, the child and your student sports experience. People that made an impact on my life. I took this picture in 1968 of Kyuha Kim, who uh, we posthumously at the USGA promoted the 10th Don. And I had the pleasure and honor to bring that certificate to his funeral and actually put that right in his coffin. Mr. Kim, uh, I met him when I was 11 at the Jewish Y. He walked in lumbering along at six foot two, handsome guy, just you could see you could take the whole room apart. I've never seen anyone with that type of judo skill. Well, yes, I have, Kilsoon Park and several others, but uh, it was love at first sight. When this man entered the dojo, which was the old boxing gym at the Jewish Y, I looked at him and I said, I'm gonna follow that man for eternity. And wherever he goes, I'm gonna learn everything I can and be thankful every day that I could be around him and have somebody who could be the Olympic coach of Korea teaching a bunch of uh, spoiled Jewish kids on a Saturday afternoon for $10 for 10 weeks at the Jewish Y. Little did I know the background story and he was having a visa problem. The two factions in Pittsburgh were fighting. They were trying to get him to go back to where he came from. And one of the judo people, Frank Brzezinski, called the head of the Jewish Y, who was tied to the wrestlers like Bruno Sammartino and all those people, and said, we need a job for Mr. Kim so he can keep his visa. And he said, I can have him teach a $10 for 10-week judo class. That's the best I can do. And they said, sold America. We'll take it. So he was there protecting his visa and I was there trying to become Bruce Lee. Our paths collided. These are some of the people that I recall all too well from uh, the early days of my judo experience. Let me go back to that. Some of these people, there are a few of you on the phone call that can remember uh, Joe Bova, Paul Bova's dad, Ron Pardini, who was the chief of police in Upper St. Clair. We just had a dinner to celebrate his life in Pittsburgh a couple weeks ago. Uh, Tom Eschenbaum, one of the best judo uh, competitors I've ever seen. Rich Redding from Johnstown. Kilsoon Park, who's still alive and well, living in Akron. He's the head of the Korean Judo Association in America. He was a uh, silver medalist in 1967 at Salt Lake City's World Championships. And when you go into Kilsoon Park's office, there's a picture of him walking across the big stadium in Seoul, Korea, back to like 80,000 people. And, are, and he's dressed in a cap and gown. He got his honorary PhD from Yongin University because he went back in 1988 and helped the Korean team win some gold medals. One thing I learned from being raised in Pittsburgh with Korean instructors, and then eventually in 1985, coming out to California and finding myself in uh, little Japan out here in Nankaville. Those Koreans and the Japanese didn't like each other very much. 
and and there's a lot of competition, particularly in the international economy. I mean, you know, Japan was the leader in cars. Korea became the leader in cars. Japan was the leader in electronics. Samsung and all these companies sprung up. There, there, there is a battle going on there between between South Korea and Japan. And at 1988. 88 in the Olympics. I have the actual article from the Wall Street Journal. I've not been able to find it online. But in 1988, they ran a front page story about how at the Olympics in 1988, the only sport that the South Korean government gave a bounty if you got a gold medal was a million dollars to any Korean team member who got a gold medal. And that was their FU to Japan. And you can ask my friend Kevin Osano about how he lost his match by a decision. He still says, I don't know what happened, but somebody made a million dollars on that decision. Let's just put it that way. It's, it's incredible, the, uh, the, the rivalry between those two countries. And Kilsun Park, getting back to his honorary PhD, that's why Youngin University gave it to him. Excuse me, I have four dogs and somebody's coming to my door. I hope that doesn't disturb people. Anyhow, you can see pictures of me with Kilsoon Park back in 1970. Later on, when I was at the Kodokan in 95, I got to meet Daigo Sensei. And uh, those are my three kids. Excuse me one second. Go ahead, little girl. You can go. You stay in or you leave. All right. My little pug staying with me. And then... Uh, that's Kano's great grandson who died about a year and a half ago when I was at the Kodokan coaching the blind judo team with Dr. Z in 1991. And these are some of the people I grew up with. Uh, John Belushak, who's standing to my immediate right, I taught him how to fall. Paul Bova, who took the gold medal in Cancun at the Veterans in 2018, and I got the pleasure of being his coach. Uh, he started judo in 64 with his dad. Ron Pardini, seventh Don, he's the uh, retired chief from Upper St. Clair. And that's my good friend, Jan Finkbeiner, a seventh Don, who runs the club in Altoona. Uh, these are some of the people that I grew up with. So let's talk about self-esteem and self-confidence. Too often coaches and athletes base their self-esteem on wins and losses. When they do so, they lose control of their self-esteem. Winning and losing is not fully under their control or our control. There are many factors in determining the outcome of a, of a battle, of a competition. It could be the actions of the competitor. It could be the actions of the opponent. It could be that the uh, referee forgot their glasses and it could be uh, luck. A lot of different things. And if we really look at the truest sense of a samurai, Masashi, basing everything on outcome is, 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 is not necessarily the way of a warrior. Uh, I like to think of Mu Shin, no mind, being there, being at the here and now. Very important, very important to mindfulness, very important to reducing people's anxiety about uh, if you think too much about the past, you can develop depression. If you think too much about the future, you develop anxiety. So, you know, being at the here and now, very important for a healthy individual, a competitor, and a coach to focus on the here and now. And it's not healthy to base your self-esteem on just winning and losing. Positive self-esteem. Do yourself as a competent and worthy person living up to your own realistic standards. If you feel worthy as a person, you will recognize worth in others. You know, I, I, I have, that can be taken so many different ways. Like when I'm around people that are not trusting, I somehow realize they're some of those people are the least trustworthy people. It's just, it's just kind of a irony how these things go hand in hand. If you care about yourself, you will most likely care about others. Your success as a coach is strongly related to your perception of yourself as a competent person. As a well-developed philosophy of life, of coaching, will be, this will be one of the most important things to pursue in making your friends and your career in coaching. 
I say it often. Most people, they feel they're blessed that they have one or two close friends. I probably have at least a dozen or more, maybe even 20 or more. And uh, it takes a lot of work. But I'll tell you, the rewards are great to know that I have lots of friends that have my back. And most importantly, as Neil Young said, they'll tell me, Gary, you're pissing in the wind. Mushin, no mind. And the bottom line is, this is one thing I've learned. Self-confidence is much more important than self-esteem. The difference between self-confidence and self-esteem is you can give somebody a participation award and say, hey, you did a great job, and they virtually did nothing. Self-confidence, I went out, I got thrown three times, but I was able to get in there, sustain myself during the battle, and I survived. That's self-confidence. I'll take self-confidence and, and developing self-confidence in my students, my kids, any day over self-esteem. Three major objectives of coaching. To win, to help people have fun, to help people develop. And that last one, again, not to sound like a bleeding heart California liberal, that is the most important one in my opinion. And I'm not a bleeding heart California liberal, by the way. Phys physically, psychologically, and socially. What are, what are, what are, which of these objectives are most important to you? And I threw in a picture of when Rhonda used to come to my club years ago and train at my dojo. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, when she went to the Olympics in 2008, the person responsible, mostly responsible for her funding is a person named Dr. Jim Lawley. Dr. Jim Lawley was a board member of the USJA that I brought in. He's one of my Sondons. It's a very well-to-do business person. And he personally fund, funded Rhonda probably to the tune of about $30,000 based on my recommendation. And that's what led Rhonda to becoming the bronze medalist and the UFC champion and everything else. And uh, very proud of the fact that, that, that uh, we had a connection in her success and that, you know, she brought a lot of fame and notoriety to judo. In fact, the, that picture below is when I got to uh, give her fourth dawn certificate at the Winter Nationals. Recreational versus competitive programs. And there you see uh, Jim Pedro Sr. What a character that guy is. He does like cigars. I can say that for him. Um, look at all the people he's developed besides his son, Rhonda, Jimmy, Travis, to name a few. And of course, Caleb. What you have to look at who you have in your club. Like, do you have serious athletes? Do you have recreational athletes? What type of program do you want to run? These are things you have to ask yourself. Are your coaching objectives compatible with the program objectives? There's, there's, are things congruent? Are, 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 are you teaching a program for elite athletes and you got a bunch of little kids that just want to come and have fun in your club and run around? I mean, you know, the words and the music have to align. Helping athletes develop remains your first priority. Athletes first, winning second, motto of the American Sports Education Program. What does this mean? And that's a shot from the Winter Nationals, by the way. Every decision you make and every behavior you display should be based on first, what you judge is best for your athletes. Second, what may improve your athletes and team's chances of winning. So put the athlete and their, their welfare always first. Winning or striving to win is never more important than the athlete's well-being. And I've had to make many decisions, as all of us have, where you pulled somebody out of a big tournament, they were on their way to getting a gold medal, and you knew it just wasn't in their interest to continue. I mean, we all read about Yamashita in 1984, breaking his ankle and then beating the guy from uh, Egypt. That's a great yarn to tell everyone. 
But when you're faced with that situation yourself, I would hope you'd put your athlete's well-being before the win. When winning is kept in perspective, sports programs produce young people who enjoy sports, strive for excellence, dare to take a risk and take and make an error. That's one of the things I really like to talk about to my students, especially when they first go to the tournament for the first time. They'll come in and they'll see how they lost, you know, and I'll talk to them about that. And, uh, and what I'll try to do is just like Masashi said, I'll try to refocus their mind on the fact that they entered the arena or like on the back of our USJA card, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's, uh, the man in the arena home. I mean, you know, let's face it, winning and losing are outcomes, but if you're in that damn arena and you're doing it, you need to stand proud. And if you got your student and we're able to deliver them to put themselves in harm's way, take a risk like that, risk being embarrassed. And Maria, by the way, she doesn't like me anymore, but that's besides the point too. <laughs> she, she made one real good statement at this uh, night of champions we had where she spoke and Bregman spoke and Hayward spoke and Hal Sharp spoke. And she said, if she got one thing out of judo, and I do this to my students when they first start, I call them up in front of the class and I said, you may have had the COVID vaccine, but now I'm going to give you a new vaccine. And I pull up their sleeve and I pretend I'm giving them an injection. And I say, this is the embarrassment proof injection. You're now immunized against embarrassment for the rest of your life. Let me tell you, as a guy who, who my perspective is sales, if I ever worried about being embarrassed, I would never have left my house. I would have never asked a girl to go to the prom with me. I would have never asked for their business. And after getting rejected 20 times, I would have never gone back to be rejected for the 21st time. Or as Tom Hopkins said, rule of 99 at the sales seminar, he said, rule of 99 is it takes 99 no's to get a yes. So every time you get a no, thank them because they may be number 99. Striving to win, winning isn't everything, but to, but the will to win is. The spirit, the will to win, and the will to excel are the things that endure. These qualities are so much more important than the events that occur, according to Vince Lombardi. Which coaching style are you? Are you the Jim Pedro Sr., where you look like you're... Uh, in the Marines, are you the real nice and, and, and encompassing uh, coach? Uh, are, 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 are you the, the one who is uh, by the book? I mean, these are all the things. Are you Jerry LaFon with your clipboard in front of you? I mean, these are the things you have to decide uh, when, you, when you become a coach. Submissive style, command style, cooperative style. Symptoms of a submissive coaching style. Make as few decisions as possible. Provide little instruction. Now, obviously, this, this presentation is biased against the submissive style. <laughs> Use of excessive Randori to fill up cl class time. I don't know that I agree with that. I think Randori is one of the greatest things that judo developed. And I can tell you, the one person who appreciated that more than anyone was Bruce Lee. When he used to work with Gene LaBelle, he learned what Randori was, and he had an epiphany. He used to say, Randori is the greatest form of martial arts practice there is. And when you look at what Kano did when he took out the dangerous moves, he wasn't doing that to make judo a wussy game. He was doing it so that you could kill each other, basically, on the mat, not have to worry about uh, uh, throws that just, regardless of how well or badly you do, wind up in an injury. Minimum guide, minimal guidance in organized activities. Pick a partner to do uh, and do mat work. Resolves discipline problems only when absolutely necessary. Some coaches adopt this style because they lack confidence and confidence. They're unwilling and unable to devote the necessary time and effort to prepare properly. And we have the uh, 
great example, my friend, Martin Covey and uh, Chris, coach tells athletes what to do, sweet play. <laughs> Athlete listens, style prevalent in the past can be successful if winning is primary objective. And of course you got the Miyagi style, gives the direction, provides instruction, discipline when needed, knows when to let the athletes make their decisions and assume responsibility. I've had a chance to meet this guy on several occasions. In fact, when I met him the last time, I told him, you know what the best line in that Karate Kid movie was? And he goes, let me guess, no mercy. And I said, no, not at all. I said, it's when you pointed at Miyagi and went, you're a pushy little bastard, but I like that. And he just about fell over laughing. And I said, you know, my, my son does that to me. He goes, dad, you're a pushy little bastard, but I like that. And, you know, last year on Cobra Kai, they reused that line. And I'm convinced it was because I put it in his head when I met him and we took this picture. There is more to being an athlete than just having motor skills to perform well. Athletes must be able to cope with pressure, adapt to changing situations, keep contests in perspective, exhibit discipline and maintain concentrations. Those qualities are nurtured routinely by the cooperative style coaching. You know, of course, we love this guy out here. I've been in, I've been in LA since 85 and uh, I've seen the Lakers play. I was at one of Kobe's first games when he was a rookie. Knowledge of the sport, technical skills, tactical skills and rules. Motivation, commit fully to the position, give your best effort, then you can ask your athletes to do the same. Empathy. Successful coaches have the ability to understand the thoughts and feelings and emotion of their athletes, thus allowing them to be better communicators and in turn, better coaches. <clears throat> Three dimensions of communication. One, include sending messages and receiving them. That's the uh, Morris code. <clears throat> communication consists of verbal and nonverbal messages. And by the way, my undergrad degree was in communications and rhetoric. So this harkened back to when I was an undergrad student at Pitt back in the late 70s. Communications has two parts, content and emotion. Coaches are typically more skilled in sending messages than receiving them. Uh, it's a lot easier to bark out orders. Expressing themselves verbally rather than non-verbally. You know, as a cigar guy, the big cigars are called Churchill's. Do you know why they call them Churchill's? Because Winston Churchill smoked those big cigars. Do you know when he would smoke those big cigars? It's when he was talking to somebody in parliament and he'd let the ash go as long as it could go. And the person he was talking to was so busy looking at the ash, they say that they didn't hear what he was getting them to agree to. Controlling the content of their message compared to the emotion of it. Is this true of you? Developing your communication skills. Somebody snapped this picture when I was given a talk at the uh, tournament up in San Jose about nine or 10 years ago. And it reminded me of when I was a kid growing up and they used to have that uh, scary commercial where they have Khrushchev come out and say, Nikita Khrushchev said he's gonna bury you. I said, you know, that's kind of a cool picture. I think I'll use that. Uh, I'm, I'm sick. What can I tell you? Develop credibility when you communicate. Communicating with a positive perspective. Sending messages high in information, including nonverbal communication. Communicating with consistency. Learning how to listen. And many times, my close friends, the same ones who tell me I'm pissing in the wind, they also say, hey, Gary, shut the hell up and listen. Shut up. You're talking too much. This is great. You guys are all muted. Communication styles. Command style, submissive style, cooperative style. Same thing as coaching styles. If a behavior is good, praise it. If it's wrong, give instructions how to improve it. Avoid sarcasm and put downs. But don't, don't sugarcoat a poor behavior. Don't be a Don Rickles coach. Follow through on your promises. 
Be consistent and positive. Be an active listener. Improve your nonverbal communications. Communicating by phone, verbal, and texting, Facebook, club website, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Flickr, blog. And we all have taken safe sport and we all have learned some of these things are no-nos for uh, communicating, particularly with minors. Reflection on communications. What coaching style do you tend to adopt most often? Are you an active listener? Do you use social media to communicate with your public and your athletes? What's your SEO? This is a very important measure. I never knew what it was until the day Black Belt called me up and said, Gary, we want you to do a weekly blog on our social media website. You have the highest SEO in judo. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Well, we did an SEO uh, accounting of everyone in judo and you were higher than Ronda Rousey. I said, how the hell could that be? She's Ronda Rousey, I'm just Gary Golds. And they said, well, you did. And this is why, because back in 2012 or 13, I did a fan correction and here it is. Fan corrections, uh, this is of course a segment where viewers try to find mistakes on our show. <laughs> Good luck. So far, there have been many challengers. I think there have been maybe 100 challengers. No winners. We don't make mistakes. Well, tonight, a fan named Gary Goltz thinks he caught us making a mistake. He claimed that during my recent interview with Tenacious D, Jack Black did something wrong. Look. I'm Gary Goltz. I'm a seventh degree black belt in judo. I run the, one of the biggest judo clubs in the US. I'm also the president of the United States Judo Association. And I'm here to tell you that you definitely had a mistake on your show. Tenacious D's fall, when he called the Tiger Roll, which is the forward of Kemi and Judo, was totally incorrect. You want a signature move, Jack? The mini Tiger Roll. It's something I learned in Judo. Responding right now. Here is his response. Seventh <laughs> degree black belt. It's me, Jack Black, 423rd degree black belt. Let's listen to something you just said. The tiger roll, the tiger roll is gonna roll around you. You say my tiger roll is very dangerous. You're damn straight. Your tiger roll is tame, like a tiger in the zoo. Instead, slaps a beef by a guy wearing khaki. My tiger roll is a wild beast living in the jungles of Nepal. It feasts on villagers. The tiger roll, the tiger roll is gonna roll out of you. 
You see why Tiger Earl doesn't meet Predacon and Olympic standards? You're right. They both banned it and have the FBI, the Mafia, and NASA for me to kick ass. The Tiger Earl is the Tiger Earl. Your tiger roll is just a big pussy cat, Gary. I do the tiger roll. You do the pussy roll. <laughs> you lose, Gary, folks. a busy guy. He's I a know. movie star. I know. He she took three weeks off to answer that. <laughs> she let us shoot in his apartment. That was amazing. Anyway, our thanks to Jack and the challenge still stands. If you think you've spotted an error on our show, report it at teamcoco.com slash haha I found an error. We will sort it out right here on the air. Let's see if you've got what it takes to make chip meat out of the maestro. All right. Yeah. Let's go. All right. Well, thank you for indulging me. I think the point I was trying to make is that that uh, has been on YouTube and it's gone viral. And it's also been on Conan's website and it's probably had a quarter million or more views. So approximately a million two, a million three people have seen that video. And that's why my SEO is so damn high. And let me tell you something, when that first went up, You'd be surprised how many people in judo, all they could say is, why is he wearing a black gi? Give me a break. I mean, you know, we have to, we have to get out of our own myopic minds. I mean, you know, this, put, this, this helped put judo on the map. And uh, again, when Black Belt was looking for somebody to do their weekly blog, they told me I had the highest SEO because of it. People are motivated to fill their needs, to have fun, to feel worthy, including feeling confident and successful. You can have extrinsic rewards, trophies, medals. Some, some places they actually even give money. <laughs> Intrinsic rewards, self-fueling, primary person purpose is to have fun for the benefit of the game. Realistic goals. Help players define and set them. Athletes experience more success and feel confident when they can actually measure their progress. They gain confidence. They discover their efforts result in more favorable outcomes. And falling short is most likely caused by insufficient effort, practice, training. To emphasize winning and reemphasize attaining personal goals. Keep to meeting athletes' needs to feel self-worthy. Maintain self-worth, essential to enhancing the motivation of your athletes. Goals should be realistic, attainable, and shared among the members of the team. Having fun can be an excellent motivator. Terms like the flow, the zone, refer to optimal activation. When this occurs, you are so involved in what you are doing that you aren't thinking of yourself as, a, as separate from the game. You become one. <laughs> it's kind of it sounds like Grasshopper and uh, they're talking to Kwai Chen Kane. The flow experience is so pleasing that it's intrinsically rewarding. Optimal activation occurs often when the primary purpose of the stimulation we seek is to have fun. And then you have the self-fulfilling prophecy. Coaches can create or intentionally or unintentionally create self-fulfilling prophecies. They can be positive or negative. In terms of reflection, how do you motivate athletes? How do you motivate yourself to keep coaching? What is intrinsic motivation? Why is intrinsic motivation superior to ex extrinsic? That 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 uh, people want real meaning out of things. They don't they don't just want a cheap uh, sell. How can you help your athletes set realistic goals? Judo is a way 
the, the, the most effective use of both mental and physical strength, according to Carl. It trains you in attacks and defenses, redefines your body and soul, and helps you make the spiritual essence of judo a part of your very being. In this way, you're able to perfect yourself and contribute something of value to the world. Jiko no Kansai, Chita Kyo, Seroku Zenyo, all the principles of judo, which by the way, my son has them tattooed on his back. And he, when he was in Japan, when he was training at Budai University, he took his shirt off and they don't like tattoos. And the, 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 the Japanese were like conflicted because they were looking at Kano's own kanji on my son's back and they weren't sure whether to be upset or whether to bow. And what I really like is one time he was getting an x-ray done and there was a Chinese uh, radiation, radiology technician and she saw Jita Kyo and she translated it better than anyone I've ever heard. She saw those and she said, those are the Chinese characters for win-win. That's probably the best, simplest, explanation for mutual welfare and benefit I've ever heard. Win-win. Why do students quit judo? Annual turnover, 25 to 85%. 42% of annual turnover can be attributed to loss of interest, no structure to the training, ukemi, bad, bad ukemi skills. And, and let me tell you, I've developed, in fact, that the clinic I did in Altoona, I only showed one thing, and it was my method on how I teach the forward ukemi. And I urge you all to uh, look at the video I put up on YouTube when you get a chance. It, it's just a simple way of doing it, but I teach it consistently, whether it's to my three-year-olds or my 65-year-olds. And uh, what it does is it gives them a map so that if they forget something, they can go uh, back to it. Some decide to focus on another sport. Too much emphasis on competition. Let's talk about perpetual brown belts. This is something that Hayward really picked up on in the last year and a half. He said in judo, we have too many perpetual brown belts that should have been promoted to black belt. Do you know when you go to a dojo in Japan, I'm sure many of you have been there, you never see anything but black belts. I mean, I don't ever remember seeing a green belt, an orange belt, a blue belt, a pink belt. I mean, once in a while, you may see somebody in a white belt. Occasionally, you might see a brown belt. But, you know, the reality is, they ought to sell the judo geese in Japan with a black belt, not a white belt, in my opinion. It would make better sense. And what's wrong with that picture? I mean, you know, Kano, he didn't call Shodan Ichidan. I mean, there's Nidon, Sandon, Yodon, Godon, Blodon, whatever you want to call it. But the first rank is Shodan. And Shodan means simply you're, 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 you've arrived, you're a student, you're a freshman in college. And in Japan, when you go to a dojo, everyone's at least a freshman in college level. And, and the judo training is, is higher level. So, I mean, you know, what I've been on the uh, campaign of doing these last couple of years is promoting perpetual brown belts to Shodan. It's good for judo. It's good for the USJA. It's good. We, we make some money. And, and people get a Shodan. And let me tell you, when you ask somebody who's a perpetual brown belt, hey, I heard you did judo, they go, yeah, I was a brown belt. When you ask somebody who was a perpetual brown belt that got a showed on, they say, I am a showed on. In other words, in their mind, they're still doing judo. This is one of the major advantages we have in judo. You know, in BJJ, to get your first degree black belt, it's eight to 10 years. And they're probably more like a sandan, even a yodan in judo. In judo, a shodan should be somebody as my old friend, or maybe he's my old friend, Jim Bregman would say, it's somebody who can dance. If you can dance, you're a shodan. And there's, there's nothing better than walking into an adult class where everyone's wearing a shodan. I mean, I'm telling you, we have to really take a look. And, and this is also, in my opinion, one of the big opportunities that I saw for judo with BJJ. 
because in every BJJ club, they got this, this cast of uh, indentured servants that help them with their clubs. They're usually a blue belt or a brown belt. Somebody who's there just doing everything. You know, it's the same thing we have in a lot of the old Japanese clubs out here. You know, I, I was like that to Mr. Kim. And, and I'm telling you, what we could do if we could get in those BJJ clubs is by getting them to also teach judo, we could get a lot of their perpetual brown belts and blue belts to being a shodan in judo. And, and they could teach judo in their BJJ clubs on their tatamis. They teach them how to fall and how to throw. And it would improve their BJJ. And as I often say, and I can say it on this call, I won't say it in front of my BJJ friends, but we all know BJJ stands for basically just judo. So let's face it, <laughs> we can get them to do more judo in their clubs. We're going to grow judo in this country. Not surprisingly, no one quit judo because of the cost. Top five reasons for quitting sports. I found another activity. I lost interest, didn't play enough. Take the fun out of participating in a sport. You take the athletes out of the sport. And here's something that I added into this talk and I had no one to turn to for this. I asked this on a USA Judo call with, uh, what's her name? The doctor for USA Judo. Uh, Unados. My daughter used to fight her when she was a triple crown champion. And she honestly said, there isn't a whole lot on suicide prevention. Pat, Hatton showed up at my club. He came to one of my club tournaments. He was the most positive, just, just, uh, just a, a ray of light. He walked into my dojo. He got introduced to me by the coach whose club he was at out here. He handed out trophies. It was, it was just a wonderful experience. Then I heard he hung himself a couple months later. And people said they had no idea he was depressed. They had no idea what was going on. So I've tried to really understand what this silent killer suicide is about and what are the signs. And, and I got to tell you, this is probably one of the darkest areas in psychology. People don't have good answers on this. My wife actually came up with one of the things to look for. She said, look at hygiene things. And it's not necessarily real overt things. I mean, it might be something really stupid, like they didn't cut their toenails for the last four months. And they're growing out and they're breaking off. Little things like that. But, you know, we need as coaches to be aware of this silent killer. There was a kid that killed himself at the Sawtell Dojo last year or the year before. He was a transvestite. He came to one of the Nanka tournaments, and I remember they put him in a division. They had to make all kinds of special provisions. Then I heard there was a suicide at their club, and it was him. So, I mean, you know, really, as a coach, take this suicide seriously and do everything you can to make yourself aware of changes in your uh, players' behaviors and, 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 and think out of the box because you may be the only thing that stands between them and being another suicide statistic. Find your focus. 85 to 90 percent of the participants do judo for recreation. 10 percent are involved in competition. Less than two percent will rise to elite players, yet they get all the national attention. And, and if there's any funding that doesn't go to people's salaries, they may get some of that. Finding your focus. Ask yourself, do your interests coincide with the interest of your students and their parents? Are you teaching, coaching competitive judo to students who don't compete in tournaments? Are you teaching sport judo to students who want to learn self-defense or vice versa? Are you using your classes as a personal conditioning workout and your students as throwing dummies? By the way, somebody told me the other day when I was teaching my Tiny Tots class, they were wearing one of those uh, watches. They said we were burning as a, a sensei 700 calories in 45 minutes. I thought that was pretty damn good. Student and parent interest. What are your students interested in? What are the parents interested in? And watch out for parents. I'll tell you the truth. Whenever parents want to start a parents club in my club, 
I get nervous. Parent involvement can be an asset or a detriment, as I just said. <clears throat> Parents, and you, and you know what? My dad never went to Mr. Kim's. I took the buses to the Jewish Y. Then he negotiated with Mr. Kim to pick me up in downtown Pittsburgh to drive him out to the club. And I did it all on my own. And you know what? As I look back, it was the greatest thing ever. Because I remember some of those kids had their dad there at every tournament. And they were like ka in every medal they had and everything. And, you know, I never had that pressure. Problem parents coach from the sidelines, pressure for promotions, harass referees, correct techniques that you have taught based on, on what they've read or watched. Helpful parents help with tournaments, fundraisers, dojo events. Educate parents from day one and you'll save yourself the nightmares later on. Instruction should be tailored to the student's needs and ability, their age, skill, desires, and goals. Determine what you're comfortable with and capable of teaching. And if the student's needs are not being met, they will leave. In junior judo, they wanna have fun, obviously. They wanna be challenged. They wanna be rewarded for their efforts. This is a picture uh, taken a couple months ago at our Tiny Tots class, I told I taught them all how to hold their belts and look like a high-ranking sensei. I told them that this was a fifth degree and up black belt move. And I said, you all have to learn this. I told them all to put their thumbs in their belts, push their stomachs out. And then I said, the most important thing you have to do is look smug. Junior judo, have regular attainable promotions. Be assured. Getting those colored belts and stripes is a big deal for both the students and their parents. Have end of the year awards, have club activities. We used to have a Quakes night where we do a demonstration on the uh, minor league baseball field. We even had a uh, demonstration we would do at the Lakers Clippers game every year at Staples Center. That was a really good one. I had Rhonda come to that. Develop a love for judo. We expect the kids and teens and all our students to maintain an interest. They may they must love judo at an early age. As uh, Hayward said, judo kurichi guy means judo crazy in Japanese. He told me a long time ago, Gary, you're judo crazy. Well, my wife's told me I'm crazy for other things too. Uh, moving too quickly into rigorous training for competition before they've matured can turn them off for judo to life. 13 to 17 years old, that's when they get serious. It should be fun until they get to be uh, teenage. Generally, children five to 12 should have fun at playing judo, the Coca Kids models. Integration of games is crucial to developing a love for judo. Avoid traditional judo teaching, warm up drill, Uchikami Randori. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you can do that, but I think you can do that in a way that makes it interesting to your players. Coaching juniors. Five to one ratio, ideal. Avoid standing around in lines, keep it moving. Develop skills that are easily linked together. And George Weir used to talk about this to nauseam when he first started teaching the coaching program, whole part whole. Show the whole move and break it down into its parts then show the whole move again. Get real good at doing that. Mr. Kim did that instinctively. I don't think he ever took a course from George Weir's on whole part whole, but boy, was he good at that. He'd come out, here's where I go, boom. Okay, pull the guy like this. Make the Thai Sabaki this way. Look at your wristwatch. Get your underarm under his armpit. Okay, one more time. Here's what it looks like. Boom. All right, everyone go practice. Integrate games between skills and lessons to keep it interesting. Make sure the games relate to skills that are being taught. Games can be a reward for correctly executed drills. And don't sweat the small stuff. Children are very good at adapting techniques on their own. Transition from junior to teen. 
identify the transition point when they're ready to make that move from playing judo to becoming a serious player. And keep in mind, not all judoka aspire to be a serious competitor. 80 to 90 percent will be recreational judo players and perfectly happy playing judo well into their retirement years. But let me tell you, a lot of people simply forget that judo is a philosophy towards life. And everything that I learned at Mr. Kim's and applied in tournaments, when I got that first big break, that job with the company that now is Apria, that I helped found, everything I did in there was basically like going to a judo tournament for me. I went to the first account, they kicked me out because they didn't like my predecessor, I got Epon. I went back to the office, thought about it, went back again, they threw me out again. Like I said, fall down seven, get up eight. I just kept going back. I just had the tenacity I learned from going to Shi'is that Rome wasn't built in a day. It's going to take a while to win these people over. After a while, sometimes they let me in just because they started to feel sorry for me. And you know what? I got their business. They could feel sorry for me all the way to the bank. Biggest challenge in retention for judo clubs is teen judo. There's one club in our area, Mojica. He has an abundance of teenagers. And I've lost players to that club. And I, and I understand why. He's got a teen group over there that's huge and they want to be around their own. Every team that stays in judo, a dozen more quit. Some leave for other sports, especially those that offer potential scholarships. One of the, one of the uh, low points of judo. I mean, I've had a couple uh, girls that got scholarships, but they were wrestling scholarships. So, I mean, they, were, they, they converted their judo skills to wrestling and then they got a scholarship. And fortunately, they attribute their success to judo. They also lead for a myriad, a myriad of teenage distractions and social engagements. Consider flexibility and allowing the student to participate in other sports. How do you keep teen athletes interested and in participating in judo? This is supposed to be a group discussion. But since we're on Zoom, I'm going to move on. Adult judo. This was one of my adult classes, uh, I think it was about a year ago, right after the pandemic. I'm getting a lot of parents, particularly from the Tiny Tots class, because they're a younger group of parents that end up in my adult judo class. You have to watch out for injuries. I mean, Sid Kelly has a good approach. He calls it Kadori and other things where you, you really have to introduce the Randori very carefully and, and maybe introduce Randori where you cooperate. And one person's the Uki, the other one's the Tori. They take good falls. Just be careful. Randori is, is, is a great practice, but it's also where a lot of the injuries in the clubs occur. And if you do it wrong, you can lose your students. What do adults want? Self-defense, physical fitness, competition, to be a black belt, they want to learn kata, they want to learn to coach, teach, referee. There are a lot of, there are a lot of op options of what you can do with your judo. And, and you know, find your students' uh, interest and point them in that direction. Coaching tips of bully the ego, no mercy. Oh, God, I have to hear that a lot. Gary, don't talk so much. Don't fall in love with the sound of your own voice. <laughs> don't demonstrate 26 techniques or variations before letting the cat class practice something. Don't conduct lengthy Q&A after each demonstration. Don't stroke your ego. Get the students on the mat. It's about them. Some of the basic judo uh, training methods are tried and true. Uchikami, Nagikami. Try to keep the kids moving. Don't bore them to death. And don't reinforce poor technique. If you see them doing something wrong, I often will point out to them, if you keep practicing in that way, you're going to become an expert at doing it wrong. 
I said, so let's practice it the right way. <clears throat> Static uchi kami, nagi kami have been mastered, move on to moving uchi kami. And controlled randori, what we already talked about. And free randori, remember, free randori is where a lot of injuries happen. So be on top of that. And if you see somebody overly muscle muscling somebody, you see one of your higher ranking students showing off at some beginner's expense, you need to step in and, 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 and intervene right away. And you need to train your black belts and your, and your co-instructors to do the same thing. Always name the technique and explain its purpose. Watch the, going off on tangents, war stories. Hold, explain the technique, full speed. Briefly relate to previously learned skills. You know, uh, Osotogari, major out of reaping throw, her eye gauche, it's kind of like the major out of reaping throw, only it's to the front. You know, give them, give them, give them analogies and things they can see. Demonstrate that one more time, that hole before they go back to practice. Teach the basics of judo. Kazushi, Sakuri, Kaki. I think I got Kazushi spelled wrong. Is that supposed to be KZ, KUZ, I think. You gotta look that up. I always find mistakes in this. Put it back together. Have your students complete the entire technique and measure improvement. Mr. Kim used to like to have the students demonstrate the throw, like go around and have the whole class do the throw. Puts them on the spot, gets them used to uh, doing a recital. Three stages of learning. The mental stage. Here, you don't wanna to teach too much. You want them to just get the overall, uh, absorb the big picture. The practice stage, learning the sequences and the movements and the timing and the coordination and the feedback. The automatic stage, when you, when you, when it becomes muscle memory. Practice the right technique. Practice the technique in game-like conditions as soon as you can. Keep practices short and frequent when teaching new techniques. Use practice time efficiently. Make optimal use of the facilities and the equipment. Make sure they experience a reasonable amount of success. Make it fun. The traditional style of teaching, warm up, skill, uchikami, randori command style of, of teaching and coaching. Often over, over emphasis on technical skill. Drills not specific to actual sport. Static versus dynamic uchikami and out transition to Nawaza. One of the things I saw when I first came to California is a phenomenon called standing randori. And for a while I was doing that. Then one day I remembered we never did that at Mr. Kim's. In fact, we always threw and we were always told transition right into the hold. And I stopped teaching standing randori out here. That started a new trend. Games approach. Emphasis on your students learning to make decisions. You want them to develop self-confidence. And part of having self-confidence is the ability to make decisions, not rely on the coach. I mean, the coach isn't going to be there when they get mugged in the alley. They're going to have to do their own judo, same in a tournament. Goal of developing tactical awareness. Focus on helping students understand what the game of judo is about, and it helps them to learn how to play the game. And students want to learn what to do by experience rather than being told stuff. Traditional, again, very little decision-making left to the player.
then again, when the risk of injury is significant, you may want to take the decision making out of their hands. Skill is too complex to master as a whole. Limited time to prepare for a contest and the focus is on short term outcome of winning. Plan your practices. Wooden always planned every practice to the minute, never wasting time. You know, if you go to a BJJ class, that's one of the things I notice they do. I mean, they have very, very tight agendas. Where in judo, we tend to be more lax. And, and, and I'm not saying that's always a bad thing because somebody asked me at the coaching class I did in Altoona, what's my agenda? And I actually told them, it depends on who shows up that night. I mean, in the BJJ schools where they have a designated audience that's coming every night and they can do uh, continuous teaching based on the last lesson, you have that luxury. But in a lot of our judo schools, we don't have that luxury. One night you could have a bunch of white belts show up at my club. The next night I could have five black belts and three brown belts and one white belt. So how it's very difficult to have an agenda-based teaching plan in, in that kind of environment. What to consider, objective of the practice, equipment needed, the warm-up, practice of previously taught skills, the cool down, um, comments, reflection, very important you reflect at the end of the class, at the end of practice. Identify the skills your athletes need, some of this is pretty redundant. I'm just gonna bust through it. Analyze your situation, establish priorities, plan practices, identify the skills. Wonder what Kay was thinking there. Know your athletes. Analyze your situation. How many tournaments will they attend? You know, one of the things I learned when I came to LA is that this is a judo rich population here. I mean, before COVID, it's not uncommon to have one, if not two Shi'is a month out here. And then the scrimmages. I mean, when I was back in Pittsburgh, we were lucky if we had a judo tournament every quarter, every six months. I mean, so, you know, this is a, this is a, me, me, uh, this area is like the Mecca of judo out here. I've, I always said that. And I think that's one of the reasons I always had my eye on living out here. All right, this is a picture from our last Winter Nationals. I'm very proud of the success of this event. And uh, I refuse to make it a point tournament. A lot of people have come to me over the years and said, Gary, why don't you make it a point tournament? You know why I don't make it a point tournament? Because I want flexibility. I can do remote weigh-ins. I can create a division on the fly. I can, I can make decisions that uh, may not uh, get you points to go to the Olympics, but may make the day that the parents came to the judo tournament a lot more enjoyable and a lot more fulfilling. And the best feedback I had was from Tony Lettner. Some of you may know him from Germany. He's an Adidas guy, he comes to a lot of our events. He pulled me aside one time and he said, Gary, I gotta tell you, this is the only judo tournament I've ever been at in the US that doesn't feel like I'm in the US. He said, this tournament feels like a tournament in Europe. And I took that as one of the best compliments I was ever given. But you know, when you go to judo outside of the US, you go to Europe or down in South America or Cuba or places I've been to, Japan. This is a major sport. In fact, judo is bigger than BJJ in Brazil. And, and for this Lettner guy to tell me that my tournament felt like he was at a tournament in Germany or in France or in the Netherlands, that was like the best thing I ever heard. And again, I won't make it a point tournament. I won't do things that are going to minimize my ability 
to make it customer oriented and, and, and a friendly atmosphere for people to come and enjoy themselves. This is an integral part of judo. It's not for everyone. On match day, again, have a game plan. I tell my players if they're not nervous, and I'm sure a lot of you do the same thing, something's wrong with them. I say, you have to have a little bit of that adrenaline going. If I have to give a speech or make a big sales call, I'm nervous as all hell before it. Keep advice simple, focus on what's effective. Encourage your players to study their opponents. And I'll tell you another thing that we're gonna talk about that a lot of people don't do. I study the referees. I'm a national referee. And you're gonna hear me in a little bit talk about how if you're a coach and you don't referee, shame on you. You need to know the mindset of a referee. And in order to understand the mindset of a referee, you need to be a referee. Never belittle a player's performance. Save the critiques for back at the dojo. And this is another thing I found out at the clinic I did in Pittsburgh, Altoona. I said, I always attend a referee meeting. Well, a couple of the people said, we're not allowed. I can tell you at the Nanka tournaments, the referees open the door to the coaches and, and more than half the people in the room are coaches. This is a must. And we hear right from Gary Takamoto what the referees are going to be looking at that day. And we hear from the coach what their concerns are. And there's great interaction before the tournaments at Nanka events. Pretty much we've said all this. Make sure the geese fit. Nothing worse than for a player to have to go out on the mat and be told their geese too short. Then they have to go change it. That ruins a person's whole psyche. And I'll tell you what, shame on the coach for allowing that to happen. And shame on the parents. Make sure the women have the white t-shirt on and the hair ties. Bring your own white and blue belt. Don't wait for the tournament to have them. A lot of tournaments aren't doing that anymore out here. I've done my job this past week. Now it's your turn to go out and do yours. Words from Wooden. Coaching on the mat side. IJF restricts the mat side coaching only when there's a mate. USA Judo hasn't enforced that. I've met both of these guys. I know Jimmy Pedro, and I had the pleasure of going to Cuba with my right-hand man, Orestes Joaquin Soler, who started Judo in Cuba. And we got to go to the Cuban National Training Center, and we spent the whole day with uh, Coach Viatia. In fact, I gave him a T-shirt from Gold's Judo, and unlike other people, I knew he was a big man. I got him a 5XL. And he loved that shirt because it fit him. And he wore it to every place he went all over the world. And I get called from Bert Becerra saying, Gary, what did you do? He wears your shirt at every IJF event. I said, Bert, I got him a T-shirt that fit him. He likes it. <laughs> Coaching at tournaments. Communication. Have, have your strategy worked out. Have your signals worked out. Coach has to main, remain in a chair out here. They're very strict. You can't be in a gi. Uh, you, some of them make you wear a polo shirt. You need to know all this stuff in advance before you go in. Don't find this stuff out too late. Do not coach from the sidelines. Don't ever film your player from the coaching chair. If Glenn Koyama's there, he'll yell at you in front of the whole place. Don't give the referee the finger. <laughs> I guess that's an obvious one. <laughs> Physically assaulting referees. That, yeah, yeah, you don't punch the ref. You know what? We had a tournament at my dojo. This has really happened. This Armenian club brought this big Russian guy in. He was huge. And this, and this other guy who was fighting was a really good player. And they went to the end of the mat. 
And finally, the, the, the lean and mean guy threw him for an e pawn. The Russian guy, when they were bowing out, walked over like he was going to shake hands and he decked the guy. I couldn't believe it, right in my dojo. And you know, I called the Claremont police and I told them, get your butts over here. And what I wanted them to do is I wanted them to take that guy out in their car and make him sweat bullets and cry. Instead, they sent over the wimpiest two cops I've ever seen. I mean, we could have done a much better job ourselves. I mean, it was, it was horrible. They didn't accomplish anything. And I told Claremont, you ought to start coming over to my dojo so I can train you in uh, uh, self-defense and defensive tactics because you guys really need it. Don't ever call out a score. Don't ever call out a score. You want to piss referees off. You, hey, that was a Wazari. I'm telling you, nothing gets the referees to hate you faster than doing that. Don't yell at the referees. Learn what the protocol is. That's why you go to the coach, the referee meeting. If I have a protest, can I come over and request, uh, uh, look at the care? Can you guys review it? Get the head referee to agree to what the protocol is in front of the referee meeting, in front of all the coaches, and then hold them to it. It's, it's, it's the way to do it. Try to remember how you felt the first day you stepped on the mat. Put as much fun in the practice as possible. Teach effective judo. Be patient. Teach respect. Remember, you came from where you came from and the people who helped you along the way and, and, and do it for them. Refereeing, another key to coaching. All right, let, this is what I'm going to talk about. If you look at this picture, what you see is Paul Bova, my friend from Pittsburgh, winning the gold medal match in Cancun at the World Veterans. He just threw the guy from Italy for an epon. The referee is calling epon. And the guy over in the coaching chair is making a gesture of victory. That's me, by the way. Anyhow, we had a plan going into this tournament. <clears throat> Paul's a national referee, so am I. Before the first match, I said, Paul, you go out there and do all the attacking. You just attack like a banshee and leave the rest to me. Every match, Hajime, he started attacking immediately. Within the first 10 seconds of his attack, I didn't yell out names of throws or anything, but I'll tell you what I did yell. Paul, you're doing great. You're doing all the attacking. Keep it up. You're the one doing all the attacking. Within 20 seconds, every time I did that, there was a mate. And guess what? The other player got a shido for non-combativity, making them have a disadvantage. In some matches, they even got two shidos for non-combativity. They still didn't catch on. Believe me, that strategy worked like a charm. Paul's a national referee, and I'm a national referee. And again, you can't, if you want to piss a referee off, say you missed a Wazari. But if you want to get a referee's attention, they look over and say, hey, that Colts guy's a national referee. He knows what he's talking about. And he's just yelling at the other guy's not attacking. Maybe a subtle influence. It worked like a charm in Cancun. Anyhow, hey, you know what? I think I'm at the end of my time, 3.30. This is great. <laughs> I went through 95 slides, guys, and they did it fast. Let's talk about some people I want to acknowledge. And then we'll, and Rob, I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to you so we can have a little discussion. But I do want to acknowledge the three key people in these pictures. The first one is Chima, who was the head of the USGA coaching program for years and is a, a stand up guy. In Jewish, we would call a guy like Chima a mensch. And he's going through some health issues right now. And uh, he, needs, he needs his thoughts and prayers. and needs everyone to think positive. Matt uh, Vanderhoek is a captain with the LA Sheriff's Department. He did the coaching clinics at the Winter Nationals for me. What I like about Matt is he's a professional trainer. And I sent him the coaching slides that we had. 
And I told him, make it look like something you would use at, at LASD. And he's the one who went through and carefully uh, professionalized this presentation. I owe him a lot. And then the last guy down in the bottom is a good friend of mine who some of you may know. It's uh, Ed Rodriguez, Eduardo Rodriguez from uh, Puerto Rico. He lives in Orlando, Florida. He's a chief federal judge. He's on the Veteran Commission for USA Judo. He's also on the Veterans Commi Committee for the PJC. And he's considered to be the, uh, the, 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 the coach of all veterans judo. He goes, to, when I went to Cancun, I watched this guy. He went out and he fought two matches, did his best. And then he spent the rest of the time coaching every American player on his own dime. This guy had the heart and soul of somebody committed to the players. And those veteran players like Ray Marquez, you see in the picture, they wouldn't be the same without uh, that cheerleader being on the mat. He's the epitome of what I consider to be a great coach. Thank you for your time, gentlemen and ladies.